Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study on the lines simply presented. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to study here this afternoon. We invite your spirit uh, to teach us. We pray for those watching this video online that your Holy Spirit can speak to them. And we're thankful for those that have uh, searched the scriptures to find this message. And we just pray that you can bless them, that your angels can watch over them. Give us wisdom and understanding as we open your word together, as we look at the spirit of prophecy, as we look at our history in its simple line. We just pray, Lord, that you can help us to see things clearly. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Now, um, we, this is uh, study number four, uh, uh, and I believe that this is the study that we're on because we did study number three, Millerite history. And um, I think that we were completed with that from what I remember. I was actually talking to somebody uh, prior to this study that had found um, the Josiah Litch prophecy paper on academia. And so I went through on the whiteboard, you can see behind me, I got 391 years. So we went through a bit of stuff. So I didn't have time to look over, but I'm pretty sure that I'm on number four now. Right. So if I'm not, somebody remembers, you can correct me, but that's what I remember. Um, now, this line, of course, is the end of modern Israel. So in this series, we've had uh, the beginning of ancient Israel, the end of ancient Israel, the beginning of modern Israel. And now we're looking at the end of modern Israel. So we know that we're repeating Millerite history. And so this reform line that we are in is, is simply the pattern uh, that we see in Millerite history. And we know that Millerite history is where we first see this pattern and that we could look at, we could look back at the end of ancient Israel and at the beginning of ancient Israel, and we could see this same pattern. Now, one of the things, of course, um, that, that that when we look at these different studies, and I'm, I'm just going to bring them all up here, just um, so we had, this was the paper that we finished. Yeah, there it is. That's the, the beginning of modern Israel, which we had gone through, right? And... Um, Then we had number two and one. I can probably look at those at the same time. Yeah. There we go. So there's one, and I guess the other one won't open at the same time. All right. So we had when when we look at this, we see that. Um, at the beginning of ancient Israel, we go back to the line of Moses. And when we look at the end of ancient Israel, we look at the line of Christ. But one of the things that, that we, you know, we know is that there is the main line that really connects us to Millerite history. And that, of course, is the line of the decrees, right? So we've looked at that. But we know that all of those lines come to bear in our time that our line is the last line, the end of literal Israel, or modern Israel, and pardon me. And, um, and this is the reform line, as it says, of the final generation. So we can go through this, uh, read, read this, and, and talk about it. So um, the study starts with a statement from uh, the 1888 materials, page 804. God has given the message of Revelation 14, their place in the line of prophecy, the messages of Revelation 14, their place in the line of prophecy. And their work is not to cease to the close of this earth's history. The first and second angels' messages are still true for this time and are run parallel with that, with this which follows. The third angel proclaims his warning with a loud voice. 
After these, said John, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this illumination, the light of all three messages is combined. So we believe that this is the time in which we exist. We're in this third angel's message where this other angel comes down from heaven and the earth is lightened with his glory. So that's the other angel, sometimes refer referred to as the fourth angel, though in reality it is the second angel of Revelation 18, Re angel of Revelation 18, that joins the third angel. But of course you can't have uh, a third without a first and a second, and of course you can't have a second without a first. So when she says all the light of all three messages is combined, we can see that this is a repeat of all of these messages. So, so this line is a line that Ellen White says is going to happen. That's why we study and understand this line. Uh, the people began to come in at first few in number, but increasing to a crowd when the spectators increased, everyone would begin to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket, scattering them on the table. Now this is just a quote from early writings, but it is a quote from William Miller. So Ellen White's quoting William Miller's dream. And uh, we see here that there's this scattered and scattering that's going to be mentioned um, seven times uh, once the dirt brush man comes in or, or before the dirt brush man comes in, um, uh, pardon me. So, so we call this, according to Parminder's study here, that this is the scattering of 1863 to 1989. Now, now we can say, I mean, is that where we're going to start the scattering? Are we just gonna say it's 1863? Now, why is he starting it in 1863 to 1989? What would be the reason that he gives those dates? So would he be connecting it with uh, Daniel chapter 5? The 126 shekels, meaning, meaning, Tico, you farce. Okay, which is what I think. Now, is Daniel 5 connected to Daniel 4? Any of you guys there? I don't hear anybody. Yes, I'm here. Okay. okay. So is Daniel 5 connected to Daniel 4? So Daniel 5, Belshazzar, Daniel 4, Bel, um, um, Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar has scattering, right? Yes. Right. So... Um, so we can see that those two are connected. And so we, we can say that this scattering is typified both by Nebuchadnezzar in his seven times, uh, which occurs four times, and, and also that the 126 years from the 126 shekels of Daniel chapter five. Okay, so so we can connect these these two ideas. Now, um, so he makes a note here. James White designed the 1863 chart while discarding the first prophetic period that William Miller found, the 25, 20 year prophecy found in Leviticus 26. This prophecy denoted the scattering of God's people. So. We're just taking the rejection of the 2520 on the chart. And we know that James White didn't actually reject the 2520 um, because the article that was often attributed to James White, written in whatever, January 26th, 1864, was actually written by Uriah Smith. But um, people just believed it was written by James White because of how 
the EG white disk is set out. It just puts, if it's unauthored, there's no author given, they will just put the editor's name. And James White technically was the editor, even though he wasn't actually uh, doing any, any editing at that time because of the death of his son, Henry, and he was traveling with Ellen White. So the editor was actually Uriah Smith, and Uriah Smith wrote the article. But, um, but we do know that the 2520 is left off of the chart, and, and that's important. Plus, it's the year that the church organizes, plus we have the prophetic mirror represented on the chart in the week of Christ. <clears throat> Now we see here Revelation 3, 17 and 18. Of course, that's the message to the Laodiceans. And, and then we have more here from um, the 1888 materials. Not dealing with, um, and it's kind of a lot of ellipses here. There are dangers and serious wrongs in the review and herald office. If the light now being given of God is not accepted, man's wisdom will be accepted as the wisdom of God when it is originated by Satan and put in the minds of men. Now, it's kind of interesting here because Parminder is the one who put together this paper, but he basically is a good example of this, right? So here he, um, he wrote something that actually demonstrates what he at least eventually is going to be doing because <clears throat> he's going to reject, of course, the 2520 but later on in 2019. So we know that um, there are but two parties. Satan works with his deceiving power and through strong delusion catch, catches all who do not abide in the truth, who have turned their ears from the truth and have turned unto the fables. Um, so we can see here there's this new organization. Now this new organization is the books of a new order. Right? And um, the enemies of souls has sought to bring in the supp supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom had given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do wonderful work. The Sabbath would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. With God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which, without God, is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand, and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. So we can see that this actually has occurred, and, and we usually mark that as 1919, the beginning of the books of a new order. Now, so we have this progressive destruction, this scattering that's occurring, and now we're going to have the time of the end. Uh, so the time of the end is the fall of the king of the south, Daniel 11, 40b. And um, uh, we know that right now in the movement presently, um, when we deal with the king of the south, the king of the south in 1989 is atheism. But who is the king of the south presently? So it was the Soviet Union in 1989. Who's it now? 89, you said? In 89, it was the USSR. That's the Soviets, yes. Then, but now, who's the... Now, it's the, now it's the globalists. Now it's the globalists, right? The UN, okay? So now we have this... This understanding, which didn't really make sense to me, that the King of the South had been defeated um, in the sense of the Soviet Union fell. But we know that the King of the South still exists because you have the threefold union at the end. And when we uh, came to, to sort of recognize that 
we had in all of Daniel. We had this king of the north and the king of the south, these different battles that this was describing details in our history uh, regarding this continued conflict between these two powers. And um, the way that um, it's being understood uh, for many people is, is that, how do I put this? Um, well, what, let's turn to what Jeff did. Jeff said, because we're going, we're talking about what happened in progressively, we came to recognize uh, with the idea, we came with the idea that Russia was the king of, of the South, that, that it only came up to the neck. And, and that, of course, is correct, that it only comes up to the neck. But it, it doesn't make sense that Russia is the king of the South because the king of the South is an atheistic power. Is Russia an atheistic power? Well, it used to be. Yeah, but it, it isn't now. It's actually more of a Christian nation than the United States. Yeah, it seems as though it's being adopted is more it, and more. Because it has officially a Christian nation. Really? Uh, yeah, their, their, their religion, the state religion now is uh, Russian Orthodox. Right. So they're not an atheistic nation any longer. Um, it makes sense. I mean, you know, because we knew they were being oppressed. The Christians were. Yes. Yeah. And so after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, gained favor with the state once again. And, and uh, um so it's now the official religion, and and uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, uh, consults and talks with uh, the head of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, and and they believe uh, what they are doing in their fight with Ukraine and all the other things that they're doing, um, and in their opposition to the United States is that they're promoting Christianity. So, so they are a Christian nation. So they can't possibly be the king of the South. Russia can't, and so. We had this idea that Russia and the United States were going to be fighting each other and that this was a continuation of this King of the North, King of the South battle. But we realized that uh, with the events that happened with uh, Trump losing the election and um, the Democrats taking over, which the Democrats are the globalists, that the globalists took over the United States on January 6, uh, 2021. So, so this wasn't, of course, understood. We just have the fall of the King of the South. But we can see that the King of the South, the Soviet Union falls, but that's not the end of things, right? The King of the South still exists. Um, and then we have the first angel arrives. So the first angel arrives at the time the Soviet Union falls. And along with this is the dirt brush man from William Miller's dream. So we're not going to go through this in detail, uh, but we are going to read part of it here. Uh, so, because it's interesting how he puts this together. Then while he brushed the dirt and rubbish, false jewels and counterfeit coin all arose and went out of the window like a cloud, and the wind, 9-11, carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment. The first angel's message. When I opened them, midnight cry, the rubbish was gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold and silver coins, they scattered in profusion all over the room. Now, um, and then it says, uh, he then placed on the table a casket much larger and more beautiful than the former and gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, the coins by the handful and cast them into the casket till not one was left, although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of the pin. He then called upon me to come and see, which he says is the third angel's message. Now, whether that's, you know, exactly correct or not, we definitely can see uh, some of these symbols, like the wind representing 9-11. Um, but, of course, we have 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. 
Uh, but here it would be applied as the empowerment of the first angel. And, and then we have the midnight cry. So he's going to put this as he opened them. And this would be a cry goes at midnight, right? That is, they waken from their sleep. Um, they're saying that that's the midnight cry. And, and then we see this gathering here. And then this call, come and see. <clears throat> now, when we have a reform line, uh, we have the first angel's message arrive, and then we would have this increase of knowledge. So in our history, I mean, Jeff is in 1989 going to be studying uh, the first angel's message. Um, I mean, he's giving the first angel's message. He's studying Millerite history. And he understands that the first angel's message has arrived. Now, he's looking at the second angel's message as arriving when? When does Jeff mark the second angel's message arriving to join with the third angel? You know, prior to 9-11. Where does he look for that to occur? Well, he's going to look for it to occur at the Sunday law, right? So like Ellen White, he sees Revelation 18 as being the Sunday law. Right? Is that how we understand it? Yes. Yeah. So after 9-11, he then comes to recognize that First, he's going to recognize the first angel is empowered. So he's he's not at first when they first recognize 9-11, seeing it as the second angel arriving. They're going to see it as the first angel arriving or, or being empowered. And then after a time, they come to realize that the second angel arrived at 9-11. But this isn't initially how they looked at it. Now, so in that publication of the Time of the End magazine in 1996, Jeff doesn't have 9-11 there. Um, but the thing that we see when you read that, you can see the foundation uh, strongly being laid, but that's the formalization of the message, that magazine. And then you can see that what they do is they put the first angel is empowered and the second angel arrives on September 11th, 2001. So because this was done in 2015, this study, we have the second angel arriving on September 11th. Um, but we wouldn't have had that happening earlier. So it's not until 2014 when we begin to understand um, the midnight cry that we start to see 9-11 as the arrival of the second. <clears throat> and then the angel of Revelation 18 descends. There's a worldwide message. So there's Revelation 1 and 2 and 3, but not Revelation 18 verse 4. So it's 18, 1 to 3. Why not 18 verse 4? Why do we single out um, or separate out that verse in Revelation 8. Eighteen, I mean, Revelation 18. Because that's going to be the call itself. Revelation 18, verse 4, 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Right. So that's the call to come out of Babylon. So we don't have that happen at 9-11. We just have the first and second angels message saying that Babylon is fallen. Right, the, the second angels message. Okay. So any questions about that? So we're going to read this. Now comes the, wor the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. This I have never said, 
I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, of terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth, but I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York. Only I know that one day the great buildings will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. So here we see that she mentions Revelation 18, 1 to 3, but not verse 4. <clears throat> now, the last crisis, this is taken from uh, Testimonies chapter 9. Right? In, the, in that section on the last crisis, we have this whole uh, message regarding uh, what happens to the buildings in New York, the great buildings. And these, of course, we understand to be uh, the Twin Towers. <clears throat> and then she says, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. She quotes Isaiah 24, verse 1 to 8. <clears throat> and we're not going to read that. Um, but we are going to um, look at this, the trumpet, the alarm of war, right? Sound the trumpet, the alar alarm of war. Now, what some people do is they try to take 9-11 and, and have a repeat of the trumpets. But if we understand this correctly, we know that under the seventh trumpet, the third woe occurs, right? Correct. So when we have the trumpet here sounding, this is the trumpet of the, the seventh trumpet of Revelation, right? But it includes the third woe. The third woe doesn't arrive October 22, 1844. The trumpet begins to sound there, but we know it's progressive. So we don't have a repeat of all of the trumpets, but that's generally what it, people are trying to do in Adventism, is ignore the, the historic understanding of much of biblical prophecy and, and opting for a more futuristic understanding. But if we understand prophecy correctly as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a continuation. Prophecy is a continuum. It gives us a line from the past to the present. Where futurism just looks at, at all these prophecies as really primarily fulfilled in the, in the future. And that's a counterfeit of the idea that the Bible writers have written more for our time than, those, than the time in which they lived. <clears throat> now, um, the restraint of Islam, uh, here he's going to give this verse, uh, Revelation 7 verse 1, and of course that's going to be the chapter in which the 144,000 are introduced. Um, but we know it says, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of heaven, of, of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And of course, the number that's going to be sealed is 144,000. Now, when we look at Revelation 9, we also are brought to uh, this same sort of uh, situation. We go here. So this is going to be under the fifth trumpet that we're going to have uh, the five months, and we can see that um, uh, that they're not the same idea of not hurting things, the grass of the earth, neither the green thing, neither any tree, but only those men 
which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So we can see how Revelation 7 is attached to Revelation 9. And, and then, of course, you're going to have uh, the sixth angel sounding. That's the, and that's going to contain with it the second woe. The second woe ends prior to the sounding of the sixth angel. The seventh angel doesn't sound until um, uh, <clears throat> 1,533 days later. Right. So after the second woe ends, it's 1,533 days to the seventh angel beginning to sound. <clears throat> okay. Now, if we continue on with this paper. Oh, move along pretty quick. <clears throat> Now, um, Genesis 16, verse 12, right? So that's what we're going to look at next. And Genesis 16, 12, what is that? We should know. Relates to so this is rebellion. A it's what? comparing Ishmael to a wild ass. Yeah. So what you're going to have is you're going to have um, the Lord speaking to Hagar and giving her a promise about a son because she's been kicked out <clears throat> along with Ishmael. And it happened because Your question again, please. So why is ha um, Hagar, um, wh what's happening here in chapter 16? Chapter 16? At yeah, Genesis 16. Here, let's, here, I'll flip there so you can see it. So you're going to have, um, <clears throat> so she goes, he he goes into unto, unto Hagar, she conceives. And, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thine, thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, uh, whence comest, camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her, under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Right. So here we have this prophecy of Ishmael, and um, now this, of course, is an important part of our message because it helps us understand 9-11, that is, we see a restraint of Islam. And uh, so this is, he's going to be a wild man, it's really a wild ass of a man. Uh, in the, so this word that's translated as wild in the secondary sense of running wild, the onager, the wild ass, literally a wild ass of a man. The description of Ishmael vividly portrays the characteristics of his descendants. The wild ass for which we see um, Job 39, 5 to 8 and Hosea 8 to 9 is typically untamable. 
strong, free, roaming, suspicious, and an untrustworthy animal, living wild in the desert, far from the haunts of man. Um, and then we have uh, the story of Ezekiel 37, verses 11 to 9. So Ezekiel 37, 11 to 9. That's going to be, of course, the Valley of Dry Bones. They, then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is lost. Uh, we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So uh, this prophesying unto the wind, uh, why are we connecting this with Islam? Why is, why is he placing it here in the east wind? Okay, so we have the word wind, right? Um, yeah, so we have in this context here. Let's see, thank you. Now, it doesn't say, it says the four winds, right? So from, from all four directions of the compass. But Ellen White talks about the four winds. Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. And that's how we determined it to be Islam. Right. So even though Islam we think of as the east wind, um, if it's going to be the four winds that are represented as an angry horse, uh, this is going to become worldwide. Right? Yes. Yeah. So so that's what we see happening at the present time with Islam. Um, shall we sleep on the very verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull, cold, and dead? Well, that we might have in our churches the spirit and breath of God breathed into his people that they might stand upon their feet and live. So we can see also that when you have this wind, um, these poor winds, they're, 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 they're seeking to break loose. We also have at the same time, the wind represent God's spirit. So what is the connection between uh, the prophecies of Islam and the outpouring of God's spirit? Okay, Francis has concocted Chris Lamb. I don't know if he concocted it, but yeah, what we see is is uh, the Catholic Church, the papacy, reaching out to uh, Islam. But what what's the connection between the Holy Spirit being breathed upon God's people and the prophecies of Islam? Because when we think about the Holy Spirit being poured out, I mean, we, we just think that God just pours it out. But isn't it poured out in connection with the understanding of prophecy? Yes, it is. So, you know, people want to pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray to the Holy Spirit, whatever they want. They want this Holy Spirit power. But that power is in God's word, in the prophecies. It's not something he just magically sprinkles down upon you. It comes with the message. 
<clears throat> so the fourth angel typified by the first angel. Now, this is interesting because Parminder later comes to understand that, and, and Jeff just accepts it for some reason, uh, that waymarks can't typify each other. And, but if you think about the fourth angel is typified by the first angel, it's really actually the second angel, but the second angel coming again the second time. Um, here's what we see in the spirit of prophecy. I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second appearing. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn man of the coming wrath of God. Though it was shed upon all, some merely came under its influence, but did not heartily receive it. Many were filled with great wrath. Ministers and people stoutly resisted the light shed by the mighty angel. But all who received it withdrew from the world and were closely united with one another. So what is this? Um, how is this saying that the fourth angel tip is typified by the first angel? Your question again, please. Okay. So we we read this statement in the spirit of prophecy, and it says fourth angel typified by the first angel. How is this statement? So, I mean, this happens under the first angel, but it shows us what happens under the second angel in, in the repeat of history, what we call the fourth angel. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was the glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary statement, station in the world. And in some countries, there was the greatest religious interest, uh, which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. Now, when we think about this, um, So we can see that this angel unites with the third angel. This is the second angel or the fourth angel. Um, that this is going to exceed um, the, the reformation of the 16th century. So, so something's going to happen that's quite a bit different than what we see today. Now he talks here about a two-step outpour, a two-step outpouring. Of course, that's the former rain and the latter rain, which we're very familiar with. And we see this in the history of, of the disciples. We see these steps. Um, obviously, first when he breathes on his disciples and tells them to receive the Holy Ghost, and then of course the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Now, then we have in our t history um, the foundations laid. Now, the foundations, of course, in Millerite history, dealing with the 1843 chart. Here we have in our history the 1843 and the 1850 charts. So these come to our movement uh, after 9-11, but 9-11, which is the empowerment of 
the first angel. And so we get a revival of the proof text method. It is line upon line. <clears throat> um, so we know about the, the table, Habakkuk's tables. But especially in 1842, they make this 1843 chart. And, and we're going to parallel that with uh, the foundations being laid. And then we have the activity, activity of the enemies. Fight against the 2520, the daily, the first and second woe, Islam. Um, so Ellen White says in early writings, page 258, I was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angels' messages. God had led them all along, step by step, until he had placed them upon a solid, a movable platform. Some stepped off the platform to examine it and declared it to be laid wrong. But I saw all upon the platform exhorted those who had stepped off to cease their complaints. God was the master builder, builder and they were fighting against him. <clears throat> and let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith. The foundations were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Now, I mean, this isn't related here particularly, but in our study of the judges, one of the things when we've drawn out lines, um, we don't always put the work of the enemies in there, but we can see it. There always is the work of the enemies. Right? Once you lay the foundation, the enemies come in. And now here, when we look at this, um, so we got uh, all of this history here. We don't see, uh, of course, midnight. And, you know, when we get 9-11, you know, here he's talking about really the empowerment of the first message. We don't even have really the arrival of the second. I mean, he does mention it. But he doesn't really distinguish out how we recognize the arrival of the second. He just sort of assumes um, that there is this um, with the first angel being empowered, there is the arrival of the second. But we can see the foundations being laid normally happen after the empowerment of the first, as well as the activity of the enemies either with the formalization of the empowerment, right? So here we don't see midnight and the midnight cry on these lines. And then he's just going to have the close of probation, the third angel's message empowered. Now, I still think the problem here is that at that time in 2015, we're not really understanding the lines because we haven't passed through enough history. So if we, we think about... The, sea, the unsealing of the seven thunders. They're not all unsealed at once, are they? The seals. Seven thunders have been sealed up. It's progressive. Right. And, and it happens as we pass through events. In order for us to understand Millerite history, we have to experience it. And so as we go through the experiences of Millerite history, we then get a clear conception of the way marks in Millerite history. That's what happens. So here, um, and, and even now, I mean, we've not come to midnight on this bigger line, but we have experienced uh, in our line, our personal line, a line that typifies what's going to happen with midnight in the midnight cry. Right? We've experienced it in lots of different ways. So they're just going to jump right to the close of probation, the third angel's message. Um, now, they're going to say the third angel's message is empowered, right? But they haven't really addressed, we know the third angel arrived um, uh, on, on um, October 22, 1844. Um, I believe it was formalized in 1888 in that history. Uh, but then in our history, we say it's empowered and it's empowered 
by the Sunday law. And so at different times, we've drawn this out differently. Um, so why do we put the Sunday law as the third angel empowered? When Ellen White puts the Sunday law as the arrival of this of the second angel that joins with the third angel. So when we're doing that, what are we doing? Because Ellen White has the Sunday law as the second angel arriving, joining with the third. But in this line, it's the third angel's message empowered. Is that a contradiction? No, because we're zooming into another waymark. But we're just into another line, right? So we have a line that exists in Jeff's line. Because when Jeff draws out this line, he's going to draw out like his whole line. He's going to start with 1989, right? It's the arrival of the first message. He's going to have 1996 as the formalization of that message with the Time of the End magazine. And then he's going to have the first angel empowered at 9-11. But then he's also going to have the second angel arrive at 9-11. And then he's going to have midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law, then the loud cry, right? And then he's going to have the close of probation for the world. So if he has a close of probation at the Sunday law, and a close of probation for the world, those are obviously two different closes of probation. Now, the way that they tried to address this back then is we would have these different lines, lines of, of shortly after this, anyway, the lines of the priests, the lines of the Levites, the lines of the Nethanim. And so we would have these different closes of probation. But that was partly right, but not very clear in that we didn't realize the fractalized nature, nature of, of, or at least how to, to look at a fractal. And we now know that we look at, at a waymark and zoom in and create a new line. And that every waymark can be a line in and of itself. So that wasn't understood back in 2015. So we have no problem with it saying it's the third angel's message empowered but if we're saying that we obviously are looking at a different line <clears throat> so Ellen White says in Great Controversy 320 Revelation 18 points to the time when as a result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14 verse 6 to 12 the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God, still in Babylon, will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world. It will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2.12, shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call. Come out of her, my people. So we look at this idea that judgment begins at the house of God. Uh, the everlasting gospel is to the Adventists first. Um, and that we're going to begin with this at judgment at the sanctuary. So Revelation 9, verse 4 to 6. We're very familiar with the idea that uh, these judgments come first upon the leadership. So the door of probation shuts for SDAs at the Sunday law. Now, that would be everyone, right? That is, if you're an Adventist, everyone who's an Adventist. And why would the Sunday law be a close of probation? Because... Ellen White says that, you know, the close of probation, there is one event that is, we would call the close of probation. But the, the, the door of probation shuts for SDAs earlier. Why is that? So 
starts at the house of God. Yeah. Yeah. So if we read this statement here, multitudes are to be gathered into the fold. Many who have known the truth have collected their way before God and departed. Um, and departed from the faith. The broken ranks will be filled by those represented by Christ as coming in at the 11th hour. There are many with whom the spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of mercy for those who have no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save. While the door is closed to those who would enter, large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. Now, <clears throat> so we see people leaving and we see people joining. So those who have left close their own probation. This is not... God declaring, let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him that is filthy be filthy still. So it's a type. Uh, here we have some statements, more statements about these messages being repeated. We've read these before. The first, second, and third angels' messages are to be repeated. The call is to be given to the church. Review and Herald, October 31, 1899. The first and second messages were given in 1843 and 1844. And we are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for the truth. By pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation, showing their order and the application of the prophecies that brings us to the third angel's message. There, can be not, there cannot be a third without the first and second these messages we are to give, showing in the line of prophetic history, the things that have been and the things that will be. So we can see that the repetition of these messages, um, we can look at here how they parallel the first angel with the fourth angel in uh, the winds, the woes, uh, the, revelate, the angel of Revelation 10, at Revelation 18, um, the lightning of the earth with his glory. And that's in Millerite history and in Revelation 18 and contains the light of the three angels. Fear God, give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come. Combines the light of all, all three angels. In this illumination, the light of all the three messages is combined. So that's something we have to look forwards, forward to. And then these are parallels between the second and the fourth. You know, of course, the Babylon, the greatest fallen is fallen aspect. And then we have. Um, now, this idea, the three angels of Revelation 14 are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, symbolizing the work of those who proclaim the first, second and third angels messages. All are linked together. Right. So we know that these are connected. <clears throat> um. Ellen White says, in this illumination, talking about the time of the other angel of Revelation 18 coming down, the light of all, th all the three messages is combined. The great message combining the first, second, and third angel's message is to be given to the world. This is to be the burden of our work. Thus, the substance of the second angel's message is again given to the world by that other angel who lightens the earth with his glory. These messages all blend in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history. The first and second angels' messages are united and made complete in the third. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages has been located by the word of inspiration, not a peg or pin is to be removed. No human authority has any more right to change the location of these messages. And then we have the two temple cleansings as well. So um, I'm not going to address that too much. And we've looked at that before. So Revelation 14 is repeated in Revelation 18. 
Right. And we see that, of course, because of the message Babylon has fallen. Okay. So there's the study for today. And, and we probably have uh, at least one more study uh, to sort of sum up this series. We haven't talked about it, but we will in our morning studies. But uh, So, bro, I, I got the first three, but I don't have this fourth one here or any of the other ones. You, you, you this is uh, we'll yeah, work it on reform yeah, you, have, you have the first three reform lines, but not the fourth. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if it was because of me or because that you didn't send it out or what. But I'll, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this afternoon and for all the blessings we receive. May your Holy Spirit continue to teach us. May your angels watch over us and bring us again to study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.